And we're now going to turn to the whole issue of network storage, um, demand management, distributed generation, etc. Um, some of this was alluded to in the previous session and the need for um, transmission where we have renewable resources but don't yet have transmission lines. Um, but we're also interested in grid security and grid stability, grid stability particularly in terms of inertia um, and frequency control, etc. Our first speaker is um, Dr. Jeff Bongers. Jeff is Director of Gamma, Gamma Energy Technologies. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Queensland. And prior to establishing his own business, he was, um, well, he was with Rio Tinto, but he undertook a number of studies of CCS, uh, various roadmaps to do with energy, etc. I must say I've known Jeff for quite a long time. So without further ado, I'll introduce Jeff and his topic is grid stability. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, then by clicker. Okay, um, this piece of work that I'm about to present uh, is a piece of a larger study. Um, given, given it was a Victorian context, um, the modelling of the NEM I'll talk very little about, and I only have 10 minutes. I'm also speaking on behalf of Andy Boston, who did most of the, the modelling work behind this and is the the driver of the IP, so all hard questions relating to modelling I'll take on notice. Um, and Steph Byerman and uh, Ian Stefel were also key parts of this project. This was sponsored by NLEC R&D, um, and they need due acknowledgement for uh, paying the bills for all of this. The context. The NIM is changing, that's no, not news to anybody. Um, it's being driven by a whole range of folk, state and federal governments, commitments made to Paris, commitments made to voters. Um, while in government or in opposition. So we tried to address a couple of key questions in relation to this study. What is needed to maintain a secure and reliable grid? Can planners, and someone did ask me who were the planners in this space, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, can planners focus on a limited set of technologies? What's available? What benefits can the NEM bring, even with its uh, weak interconnections? How can we compare costs of different technologies? I, to be fair, that's part of the big study. I don't talk about that in this, other than we talk about the value of the grid as opposed to levelised cost of electricity. How does all of that assist with decarbonisation? And what cost is the transformation? We did this using a, a model called MEGS. Um, there's a whole bunch of different modelling. MEGS sort of sits in the middle. It isn't super detailed, so it's not going to give you line current variations in Mildura where it's hot and dry, but it also doesn't do a whole system model in terms of techno-economics. So, you want any more detail than that, download the report. Now, we did mention before that uh, Finkel didn't say, oh, this is, going, this is what we have to get to by 2030 and this is my suggestion. So when I have Finkel 2030 and Finkel 2050, it's what the mix could look like if those targets were met. So. Uh, please don't read into this as what Finkel is saying we have to do. So what MEGS does is produces essentially two results. It does a demand curve where you can uh, see what technology does what for how long, and then it does a time of day. We have on the um, right-hand side, we have a particular week in May 2015, which is our ordinary, boring, very normal weather year, where it happened to be very sunny, and very windy, and not sunny and windy, all in the same uh, week. Very handy for modelling, just for the record. So when you look at Finkel for the NEM, what would that look like if we hit the 2030 targets with the sorts of technologies he was talking about? Basically, it says that it's relatively doable in terms of the process. There is a little bit of curtailment. That's the little box on the demand curve. So across the NEM, we are spilling very little energy. There is a caveat to this, however, with the renewables that we built uh, to meet Finkel 2030, we also built storage. So for every gigawatt uh, of storage, um, uh, for every gigawatt of renewables, there was some storage uh, with a four hour duration. You will notice though that black coal sort of has to do a lot of work in terms of turning off and on. 
which is not a concern to Vic the Victorians because you don't have any of that, which is a concern to uh, New South Wales and Queensland. The black coal plants that we have currently in our fleet are not designed to do that, and they're not equipped to do that, but they, are, they can do that with some modification. In the UK, they have significant experience of being able to do that. You'll notice that there are times when wind and solar dominate. That's not news if you think of where Finkel 2030 has in terms of your generation mix. You would expect solar and wind for a large chunk of the time to provide much of the energy. However, it doesn't go all the way uh, and displace all the other generation uh, technologies simply because to keep a secure and stable grid with the current technologies we have available to us, we still need, in technical terms, big spinny things uh, to do that. There are other solutions, and I'm hoping going forward other people will do clever things. Looking at what a 2050 would look like across the NEM, and lo looking at the scenario that, that Jacob's modelled for the, the Finkel, you'll see there is a large amount of curtailment. That's simply because there will be times when the wind and solar will generate too much energy. Uh, that happens. It's very consistent with the modelling in California where they're looking at curtailing wind uh, and solar going forward simply to uh, be able to manage uh, supply and demand. So what would Victoria look like using the current technologies that we have and the generation mix if um, Victoria was to do its fair share of a Finkel 2030 type? This is without Hazelwood. Um, this is still modelled in our first uh, May week of May where there is wind and solar and none. We also put a constraint on with the existing assets in Victoria is that they can't turn on and off like a black coal plant does. Um, that was done in consult consultation with uh, the owners of some of those plants and how flexible they may or may not be. So they can get to their minimum stable generation and then would be able to sit at that. So it shows that it was it, Victoria can run successfully without Hazelwood. That's not news. We are currently having the lights on and the air conditioning uh, working. So the, the, the sun will still come up and the sun will still go down and it will still all be okay. So coal remain, the existing coal assets m remain relatively inflexible. You would have large amounts of wind and solar being built. There will be times when you will export that. There will be times when Victoria will be a net importer. And oddly enough, for those of you who have the NEM Review app, Victoria becomes a bit of a trading house where lots of energy comes in and out from either New South Wales, South Australia or Tasmania and follow the arrows and it goes all over the place. So for much of the time, the flexibility services that Victoria relies on are actually located in Victoria. We also looked at what would happen to the with and without Hazelwood uh, in 2015. So you can see the slice there of, of Hazelwood on the left-hand side. Hazelwood did a fair bit of work. No, it didn't reach 1,600 megawatts very often um, uh, across the whole year, but certainly um, it was uh, a fair chunk of the generation fleet. If you look on the right-hand side, a large chunk of Hazelwood's uh, energy is being replaced mostly from New South Wales. And there is some interconnection other than New South Wales, but most of it comes from New South Wales. And the existing coal assets are generating some more through that process. Open cycles were predicted to run some more, um, oddly enough. Um, that is likely, uh, we have seen a little bit of evidence for that and likely to happen a little bit more under ordinary circumstances, not just when uh, a boiler or two may be uh, out of the picture. We have, again, you'll see that uh, brown coal does a fair bit of uh, the work by 2030 because at the moment um, the existing coal generators are expected to be in play till about then. That is a caveat to the modelling. In 2030, that's still a fair ways away and the owners of some of those assets might go, Ech, there's no money to be made um, and these, this will obviously change. The other thing that we did in the modelling is we looked at what happens if you increase the interconnectors. So we have relatively small interconnectors between all our states. 
And basically what happens is it allows the system to be more flexible. For the Victorian case, it doesn't change much in terms of the generation that happens in, in state. Uh, what does happen is you, you might get the power from different places outside the state. So in relation to how we've done the modelling, 2030, quite doable. Um, we will have to build quite a large chunk of renewables, mostly um, wind and some solar in, in northern Victoria. And we will end up being a net, well, continue to be a net importer of, of power and sometimes of grid services. So in terms of how that whole process works. So I'm going to keep it really short. So I only want to do one other slide. And I'm, while we, in the report, you'll see some, some more slides. If you look at how this works comparing New South Wales and Victoria, you'll see that um, the New South Wales plants in 2030 are still uh, very dominated by coal in terms of the, the total supply. So this really just shows you that the, the model it validates reasonably well, but if you look at the renewable portions of our current generation and where we need to get to by 2030, the grid will have to operate differently simply because the, uh, the very small slice on top of both of those curves, solar, wind and some hydro, and we do have biomass in the bigger report too, that the grid will demand all of the technologies to be more flexible. Um, simply because to, to stay in the marketplace you're going to have to do that or you will choose to exit the marketplace. So for one of the conclusions of our report is one of the drivers to have existing assets leave the market will be their ability to be flexible and their willingness to invest in their technology to become flexible. And I would argue that that's some folks in Liddell are probably thinking about that very carefully. It's not a very flexible plant if you want to stay open for another four or five years, what investment would be required to make it more flexible and more useful to the grid? So that's it. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Professor Ivan Mariels, and um, Ivan is um, uh, Dean of School of Engineering at Melbourne University and we're indebted to him for stepping up at the last minute because Professor Mansarello was unavailable. I should also mention that um, Ivan is in fact one of Australia's now current few, very few, nuclear power engineers, of which we don't have very many at all. But he's not, that's not his topic today. His topic is power system security. Thank you very much, David. Um, yes, my apologies. Um, you will have to do with me instead of Pierluigi Monserello, who would be able to give you a much better talk, but unfortunately he was called in to talk about exactly the same topic in Italy for a large European project. And when the Europeans say you've come to talk about your project, you better go because your funding depends on it. Uh, so power system security and a little bit the role of the main site resources in order to be able to supply security and reliability. That's what talk that I would like to present today. Um, I, really, I'm, I think we missed actually a session today. It would have been really nice if we had a session about what actually is electricity. Uh, if you don't know the answer, don't worry too much because the story goes that the professor asked in class, second year electrical engineering class, can someone tell me what electricity is? And then eager students put up their hand and the professor said, yes, let's, let's hear the answer. And the student paused a minute and said, I'm sorry, but I forgot. The answer of the professor was, what a shame. The only person ever in, in human mankind's history to know what electricity was forgot. <laughs> it's actually quite subtle. And, and what we're talking about today uh, and what security and reliability is, is actually uh, a testament to the engineers that built the system today. And it's a lot deeper concept than most people think about often. And I think we have a system at this point in time inherited by people that really are giants and we're standing on their shoulders. And so when we are starting to erode what they have built, we have to be careful with what we are doing. And I'm hoping to elicit a little bit of what's going on. 
zero carbon electricity. That's all we want, of course. We're going to have wind, we're going to have PV, many other technologies coming into play. Economics will somewhat tell us what comes in. What we all want is affordability, we want sustainability, and we want security and reliability. I'm not going to worry about affordability. That's better for econom economists. Sustainability is dear to my heart, and I love those technologies. But I'm really going to talk, how do you actually make a 50 hertz signal work? And that's what electricity is. How do you actually get power delivered, but you, you, you pay for energy? And why do you have some things like reactive power in the system? So it's, it's actually more to it than, than meets the eye immediately. So most of this is based on a report that was commissioned for the Finkel review, and where Pierre Luiga was the, the main author for. And if you read that report, you will find all the things I'm talking about and in much more detail. This picture. Suppose that the system is working normally, everything should be at 50 hertz, and I'm going only to talk about uh, the frequency. Frequency roughly means if everything is steady, you have power balance. There is as much supply as there is demand, and everybody is happy. For one reason or another, we have more demand coming in, and as a consequence of that, there is a response in the system. We would like to be where we want to be, And if you have a system like we know now with lots of inertia, it's the big spinning machines who give up kinetic energy to supply the energy losses that of the energy demand that the system is putting up. You can think of it, your car going up the, the hill, and if you don't press the accelerator, your speed is going to go down. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. These big machines give up some kinetic energy in order for the, the grid demand supply to be met. Then there's a response that is dictated by governors that tells you that the frequency will respond and go to a minimum somewhere, and then restore slightly and come back to a quasi-steady state. That frequency will not be the frequency where we want to be, and then later on by additional control and command, the frequency will be built up again as more and more thermal power or other power is being delivered to the site to bring that balance back to where we want to be and bring that frequency back. Not having the frequency at 50 hertz is a disaster for the grid, and especially in the grid that is as long strung as ours, where we actually have not a good interconnect between things. If there was only one machine in play, and that was all there was to it, that would be great. But for the moment, that is not the case. And if two machines don't talk the same frequency, then the grid is not very happy, and you get all sorts of difficulties. So we want to avoid this as much as possible. We want to make sure that this picture works well. So inertial response, very first thing, big machines losing some kinetic energy. We then have a primary frequency response, just getting the energy right so that we can have balance, and then we want to go back to where we want to be with the frequency for the overall operation, normal operation. That's what happens normally. In a low inertia system, this picture changes real, relatively dramatically. Two things happen. The amount of energy that we lose per second, essentially, or the amount of hertz frequency we lose in the initial phase is going to be much faster. There is actually less kinetic energy to give up, and therefore we lose frequency more quickly. That means that our grid is getting more and more unhappy quicker. On top of that, we're going to go to a lower frequency than we would have gone if we had more inertia in the play. Again, something that we're not very happy about, and then it might take a little bit longer to get back, but in the end, we're going to get back to the same quasi-steady state. And the quasi-steady state is a tool that we use at this point in time to regulate how the grid is operating. As long as we have a certain bounds, the grid is going to survive, and that's the main thing, basically. But we don't like these things happening very quickly here, and that is what happens. We, we lose, it's called Rocco, rate of change of frequency. Well, it's going to be much steeper if we have less inertia and when we have more inertia, and we're going to go deeper, and that depth point is called the nadir point, the point where you just have enough balance you can system, but it's the, the lowest point in your frequency. Both of those things are constrained on how the grid operates. 
this point in time, they don't actually appear as constraints, and the only real constraint that we're using to plan and, and not regulate the grid is actually the steady state, quite a steady state. That is going to change as we erode the inertia in the system. I will come later back. There are other ways of doing inertia, but the initial response, what is so beautiful about inertia is that there are no measurements involved. The system simply senses an imbalance in energy and it responds naturally to what's happening. I don't need communications, I don't need sensors. This just happens and it helps me. It's, from an engineering point of view, it's a design of a system that naturally responds to restore its balance. That's great. I don't have to do anything special. Every time I have to do something special or make a controller to work, I have additional points of failure and that's all possible to do that. So these are the points of constraint. You lose your frequency more quickly. You lose energy, basically, the same amount of energy, but in much shorter time because of the lack of energy. But in the end, you come at the same point. So this is actually the main crux of the, the design of the work in that paper, in that, in that report. We live in a high energy world, high, sorry, high inertia world. <laughs> And we're going to move along this curve to a low inertia world as we are moving more and more of our power, heavy power, like black power and brown power out of the system. The purple curve on the bottom there is the constraint that we, at this point in time, use in order to regulate what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. It's essentially the static requirement, the quasi static requirement for our frequency. The the vertical line here at the beginning is the line that tells us that we're losing frequency too quickly. It's a Rockoff requirement. Again, not something that comes into play when we have a high inertia system. And the red curve has to do with how far we actually drop the frequency. That's the nadir point. We need to have the nadir point sufficiently high in order to make, maintain everything. And as a consequence, do a place where we can operate at this point in time, is basically that secure area over there, the gray area. You can see from there that under this point in time, when everything is of high inertia, we really don't have to worry about any of those other constraints. As long as we have the quasi-static constraint, right, our system works. The moment we are moving more and more towards low inertia system, these other constraints are going to play a role. And the first constraint that we're going to see is how far can this frequency actually drop and we still maintain stability in the grid. And that's the, the Nadir point that's a red curve. And it's related, it's hyperbolic related to the size of the inertia essentially. And then at a later stage, we will also see how the rock of frequency comes into play. If we really have low inertia, that actually will overtake the Nadir frequency. That's the picture we're working towards. So how do we make sure that all of these things can be in play? Well, we have to probably change the way we operate the grid. That's cost comes out of it. There is nothing here that says which technology you need to use. It only tells you that the way we operate the grid right now is no longer the way we have trained power engineers. All power engineers have been trained under this scenario here. I've taught engineers for 30 years and they've all thought that. I'm now teaching power engineering completely differently because by now this is no longer going the picture of the future. And the picture of the future is much more complicated and there is a lot more control involved and there's a lot more interesting behavior involved. Things that we have to retrain people. And that's why we are uncomfortable, I think, when we are now operating the grid because we see things happening for which we have not been trained. We have to learn how to work with it. That's where we are now. That's where we're going to go. Constraint optimal control. So what we would like to do is to make sure that we are well behaved. And for that, we want to use all the technologies available. And one technique that we are presenting here is well, you could do optimization. You can do optimization of your energy, your inertia, and your frequency all at the same time. And that makes a significant difference. And that can actually be done, and that you can quantify. And here is an example of, an, uh, of, of a situation like that, where you have the green is your renewable energy and your blue is your normal energy, your, your inertia energy. Well, you have very little available there. You might want to start thinking about 
what reserve do I in place in order to make sure that the inertia requirements, my Rokov requirements, and my Nadir requirements are satisfied, and you constrain all of that together. You can principally do that with the NEM system and saying I've got a particular other constraint. But I totally agree with Tony's remark that it's actually not obvious why you would put that on the NEM as a constraint, or you could do that by regulation and define electricity in a different way, and that would also do the job. Now, what is the best way of doing it? I don't know, but I do know that for stability purposes, you will have to do it, otherwise you're in trouble. It will simply not work. And I can hand on heart say that it will not work. So that's where your problem is. You don't have enough inertia in the system at this point in time. You have to do something with ancillary services. You have to start optimizing and make sure that your constraints are satisfied. And for that, you have to look at how to do that and how your constraints are, and which constraints you have to be in place. You may have put extra inertia in place. You can do other things. And I'll mention a few other things in the possibility. But one way of doing it is you could think of it in that curve that I had there in the past. You may want to move your red dotted curve towards the blue curve. And that the old technologies that help in that space are fine. I don't really care. As long as they do that, we are happy. And there are lots of things that can happen in that space. And one thing that I would like to mention as a, as a major one, and I've heard a lot about this morning, and I totally agree with, the main management on the domain side of things is an underrated property, an underrated opportunity, because in the end, that's where really the services are delivered in energy terms, and not in frequency terms, and not in power terms. So we can actually do a lot for all of this by just changing the domain. That was all caused by too much demand. So if you lower demand in a way that you don't notice as a customer, we all should be happy. And that can be done. And that's exactly what our possible way forward. But this is not the only way forward. If you want batteries, batteries will do fine. If you want to have uh, electrolysis systems, that will do fine too. If you want to have PV, thermal with storage, that will do fine too. But they all come with their own cost, and they all come with their own ways of operating, and that will be the complexity that you have to deal with. In the end, simplicity, simplicity will win in the market. So, inertia, well, inertia is a key word here, but there is actually nothing specifically special about inertia, apart from this one thing that you don't have to do anything for inertia, because inertia is immediately sensing what the imbalance is in the grid. All the other technologies need some help. They need someone to tell them the grid is not healthy. That alone is a big hindrance. Whereas for the, this moment in time, no technology, no communication technology that works at the speed of light at which electricity works in the grid. Uh, there's a little bit of thinking required to do that. Not impossible, but we have to think about it. We can use inertia. There are other ways in the inertia condensers. We've heard about them this morning. You can put hydro pump storage in there. Hydro pump storage comes with a lot of kinetic energy as well. So they're two easy solutions. You can put batteries. You can put pumped hydro, as I said, synchronous condensers, and you can put the main management in place. All of the main management actually does is response to load frequency variations as well. And the reason why you can do that is that you have thermal energy storage in your house. All your fridges and freezers are thermal energy. Nobody cares. As long as you're meeting the fridges with the right temperature, you'll be happy. If I take a bit of energy out of your fridge, nobody will notice as long as your meat is right. So that's why I think this is a good way of going about it. In the end, you have no choice. Whatever you pick, you'll have to do some optimization in order to satisfy your requirements of stability and reliability. And that's basically the task ahead of us for the engineers, I believe, at least. And if not for the engineers, as well as the economists, to find out the best way of doing it. Here's an example of a big house where you take out the uh, air conditioning unit for a while, a certain amount of time, nobody noticed the 0.1 degrees stop, and that's basically what you can do. Oh, so that, there's a few papers here, and uh, too much paper. Uh, finished. I'll stop here. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much, Ivan. It's uh, covering a great deal of uh, information, but uh, I think there's going to be some questions about that later. Uh, our next um, speaker is uh, John Diesendorf, who's Technical Director and uh, Lead Electrical Engineer at Oricon. And um, John is going to talk about transmission and distribution. And as we heard earlier today, there are uh, some particular challenges we've got 
where our transmission lines don't match up with our um, renewable sources. So John will be addressing issues relevant to that. Thank you, John. Thank you, David. Well, um, I guess I've seen uh, a lot of the electricity industry over a long time. Um, when we used to build um, a Luoyang A or B in the SECV, or a um, Liddell or Bayswater Power Station in uh, the Electricity Commission of New South Wales, at the same time we used to build the grid to connect it. Well, since we have an electricity market, there was no need to plan that. Um, the market would take care of it. Uh, well, not quite. We cer certainly, we, we couldn't plan ahead because we didn't know where the generators would appear. <laughs> And in terms of getting the, the, the grid connected uh, to connect those generators, well, in the case of uh, the old fossil fuel coal-fired plant, it took seven years to build. And you could build the line in that time, no problem. Now we're building solar farms in a year, wind farms in 18 months, and so on. Um, and uh, it's a different story. But the market rules were written to prevent um, the monopoly grid from ripping us off by building things that weren't needed. So the market rules said the ROTT um, needed to demonstrate the need through the committed generator plant before you could justify the line to connect it. So now, of course, um, we can build the plant um, in a year or 18 months and the line will follow several years later. Well, uh, the Finkel report quite rightly discovered that this needed de dealing with and that uh, some provisions needed to be made to address it. I might say that in response to the Victorian renewable energy target, um, AEMO has also um, been trying to address it. Now, how do I make this thing work? Um, oops, excuse me. That's the wrong one. <laughs> All's well, I think. Um, come on. How are we going? Is my talk here? Hey? What's the problem? Should be that one? No? Yes. It's not, not responding. It should have died. Oh dear. Well, that is a problem. Uh, <laughs> I can't show you my slides. Oh dear, oh dear. Um, Oh, here we go. So, are we going forward? Huh? Not working. Sorry. Sorry. Just tell me what to press. They're just there for the next That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. So there's the role, role of T and D in a nutshell, but let's move on to the next slide. Um, I've already mentioned this, so we'll go to the next slide. All right, so um, this year, um, AEMO published a consultation paper on what we have to do to augment the grid to deal with um, the, desi the generators desiring to connect in, in northwest Victoria. And uh, those um, yellow circles there, according to their size, indicate um, a point of connection where if it's a bigger circle, a large amount of solar wants to connect, um, or else perhaps a smaller circle, a smaller amount, and the blue for wind. So as you can see in that upper big um, egg-shaped circle, uh, just uh, egg-shaped, um, you've got in northwest Victoria uh, proposals to connect generators of some many thousands of megawatts, um, if you can read the scale on that, many thousands. Um, but the grid itself is quite poor and not designed for this. It's capable of connecting a few hundreds of megawatts. So what do we do? So the, um, uh, the report proposed um, grid augmentation. Now, what we have here, in blue you have the 220 kV network. In solid lines, what's circuits that are there? In dashed lines, circuits that are they might build. Um, in the yellow down the bottom, you have the 500 kV 
running uh, west from Melbourne um, out to Haywood where it interconnects with uh, South Australia. In the far top left hand corner of those slides you'll see red cliffs um, right up in the top uh, corner of uh, Victoria where it interconnects with New South Wales um, and um, through a DC cable to South Australia. Well the Hayward connection is good for um, uh, well, it was uprated to do 650 megawatts, but that's been downrated now because of what happened in the South Australian system black, where the rate of change of frequency when that line tripped was too great for the power system to handle. So uh, it's been downrated. And I might mention, by the way, that the, um, the proposed uh, Tesla battery, which will be installed for this summer um, in South Australia, is not intended from that point of view from by the government to store energy particularly. It's intended to slow down the rate of change of frequency, um, as the professor has pointed out. Um, and if you can slow that down, then you don't have to have a system black if there's a disaster. You can trip off some load in time to balance it and then bring it back on again. So uh, uh, that, that is uh, what's going on with regard to the Tesla battery. There's also some uh, energy storage for a resale at a higher price at a later point in the day. Um, now in, in the, um, so uh, basically what, um, uh, what the AEMO considered here in its consultation paper on grid augmentation is uh, quite massive augmentation possibly of the 220 kV network and new interconnections are shown as well. On the top in New South Wales, you have uh, that more purpley colour, um, which is a proposed upgrade of some 220 kV to 275 kV and extension into South Australia. Um, from Haywood, heading um, further west, you have another proposed interconnection with South Australia, um, which would uh, make a very big difference. Um, Nationally, we've had mentioned that there's 21,000 megawatts of generator interest to connect, to connect um, all really renewable generation. So I want to say a word about the intermittency as well. Others have spoken of this. But um, I guess uh, I'd like to show you some, a different sort of diagram about intermittency. Um, here we have for a site for which wind data was available and solar data was available for several years. One uh, 36 days, a tenth of a year for which um, some evaluation was made, what would be the output of wind generators on this site if the nameplate rating was 1,000 megawatts? And that's the blue and uh, in the in the orangey colour down below is what if you had a thousand megawatts of solar? Well as you can see the solar changes every day on the daily cycle when the sun comes over and there's 36 days worth there a, te uh, you know, a tenth of the year. The wind is not quite as regular. There are periods of higher wind and periods of lower wind. Um, and uh, I guess the uh, important factors to note is in this particular site the annual capacity factor of the wind was 37.2%. The same site, um, when I looked at it many years earlier, in 2011, um, we were, they were looking at 31 or 32%. That's the difference of the technology improving the wind generation capability. So um, the solar, the annual capacity factor at this site was 27.8%. Well, of course, um, what that means is that um, only if you had 28.7% of the, of the plant running continuously, 24 hours a day, 24 by 7 by 3, in fact, 24 by 365, you'd get the same amount of energy um, rather than the 1,000 megawatts, just uh, 278 would deliver the energy. Now, one of the problems we're facing, as I've mentioned, is that the grid cannot handle the amount of generation that wants to connect. So 
what happens if you decide to connect to a grid that's good for 1,000 megawatts, some wind and solar? So here's a, the same diagram with the wind and solar superposed. And you can see here how um, it's not very often that the output exceeds 1,000 megawatts and needs to be curtailed. There's just three or four days there where there's a tiny bit of curtailment. The rest of the energy still gets into the grid. And in fact, um, the grid capacity factor has gone up to almost 50%. Um, so we're getting a lot more out of the same grid by combining wind and solar. And there's a real synergy because more of the winds occurring perhaps at night when the solar's not going, um, and only sometimes does it occur together and get a little bit of curtailment. In fact, in this study, the curtailment came to 1.56% of the energy, and the amount of wind and solar connected in this study is 1,500 megawatts connected to a grid that's good for 1,000. So um, you're getting a lot more out of your grid if you can connect both wind and solar together because of this synergy of uh, non-coincidence diversity. Um, of course, there are still a few short periods of part of a day where there's neither wind nor solar. And of course, it doesn't take a great deal of storage to fill those short periods of time. So uh, wind and solar plus storage can do even better. Now. Um, the next slide is really just to remind you that um, wind has a pattern geographically. It's sweeping around. Um, and if there's no wind in one place, there's plenty of wind somewhere else. So uh, we'll go on from that point. Um, that is, if you had enough interconnectors, there were the, the, the amount of, of wind that... Uh, sorry, the amount, yeah, all right, let's say wind energy that can be delivered equals effectively the capacity factor of the wind farms themselves. And the fact that one is not generating when another is doesn't matter if you've got enough connection. So these are the existing connect interconnectors for uh, Victoria. And in this, um, this diagram here, I'm showing also um, dis under discussion additional connectors. And AEMO's looked at uh, having a second bass link to connect the pump, pump storage, perhaps, in, in Tasmania with Victoria, augmenting Victoria's connection with New South Wales, um, probably in association with getting more pump storage out of Snowy, and the new interconnectors to add to the interconnection with South Australia. Now, I'm getting short on time but I'll just mention very briefly that there are some big challenges for distribution companies. Um, one of the, uh, the challenges is that now generators are being connected throughout the distribution network where previously there were only loads. Um, sometimes 10 megawatts, sometimes over 100 megawatts. I have such a project at the moment in Victoria. Um, so small scale generation can accumulate to reverse the power flow on the distribution grid. And large scale can do it, of course, much more easily for the specific sites where it occurs. And that means new voltage control and new power system protection systems. It also means that uh, distribu distributors are required um, to handle um, quite different demands from the normal distribution they've worked to, so that uh, there's a need for a change there. Microgrids connected behind the meter are interconnected generators with some energy storage. It may be your solar PV on the roofs plus batteries, loads, and of course, smarts, clever controls. They can enjoy the benefits of interconnection with the grid, but they can also survive when the grid has a problem. 
And indeed, if with proper arrangements, they can help the grid to recover from a problem. Just to round it off, what does the future hold? Well, we have a lot of grid, interestingly, um, in the Latrobe Valley to connect those power stations. Surely it might have a role more than just to connect Basslink and Basslink 2. Um, and I think on that point I ought to wrap it up and we'll have our questions. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, we've now heard that our transmission and distribution system is not fit for purpose. So hopefully Jill's now going to tell us how to solve all of these problems with um, energy storage. So Jill, Dr. Jill Caney is the Global Applications Director, Energy Storage for SNC Electricity Company. And um, Jill's topic is energy storage. Jill. So my background is as an atmospheric scientist, a climate change uh, scientist and a meteorologist. So for me, the demise of Hayward is excellent news um, in terms of air quality. Um, however, it's not quite so good news in terms of my water skiing habit because it, the, the cooling pond used to be really great for water skiing on in the winter because it was a little bit warmer. So I'm not gonna be dipping my toe in cold waters anymore. So I'm going to talk about, we've heard a lot about the complications that the electricity system is facing. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the complications. Some of it will be a repeat, but hopefully I'll be able to share some insights on how storage can help. And we've heard already that we tend to talk about energy storage when really we're talking about electricity storage and we're talking about specific electricity storage and that's batteries rather than any other kind of electricity storage, so I'll touch on that as well. So it's complicated. Um, I've put up a picture of a duckling rather than the duck curve, because I assumed that you'd all be fatigued by seeing the duck curve, but I will talk about that a bit later for those of you that perhaps haven't seen a duck curve. So the problem we have, particularly with, in, in, um, with having solar PV deep within the distribution network, is that that looks like minimum demand to the system. So at midday in summer, demand drops off because people are consuming solar generation locally, and that looks like minimum demand. And if you don't have enough demand, you can't hold enough generation to keep your system stable, and that causes problems. It also causes negative wholesale prices, which generators don't like very much. And then there, we've talked about rock-off, which is rate of change of frequency and how if that is too fast, that causes the system problems. But solar PV will cause what I like to call ROCOD, or rate of change of demand. So as the sun sets, you get a rapid increase in the need for conventional generation to resupply that demand. And that's difficult to bring conventional generation on that quickly. So you need to manage that rapid increase in demand. We also have issues managing peak, particularly in summer, when we have air conditioning load. And we've already heard about the wonders of inertia and how reliant we are currently on spinning reserve, but we're losing spinning reserve. So do we need inertia? Or is that an outdated concept? Because we've just heard about microgrids. When you have separation and you're islanded, you use a battery to provide the signal to which everything else synchronizes to. So power electronics can provide some form of inertia, but it's a very different approach to the, that that we're used to. So we've sort of seen this before. Um, renewable generation is often described as intermittent, which is typically something that is either there or not there. And I prefer to describe it as variable, which means that it changes and that cha those changes are often predictable. We're not very good at forecasting the output of renewable generation in Australia. In other locations, such as the UK, the transmission system operator can accur accurately forecast for wind to 
and that means they can manage their system services to support that penetration of wind into the system. We also tend to have a very fixated, old-fashioned approach thinking that demand is king. We must always meet demand and therefore we must ramp generation up and down to meet that demand. But actually, demand can be flexible, as we've heard. And um, so what we really talk about, what we want is when we talk about reliability is electricity when we need it. And we also talk about dispatchability. We want something that's dispatchable. That places the burden on generation, when in fact what we actually want is flexibility. And Jeff talked about flexibility. And flexibility can be provided by a number of sources. That's demand response, so you match demand to your generation. Uh, batteries, obviously, or energy storage, can electricity storage can provide flexibility. You can have flexible generation, and interconnectors are also a source of flexibility. And I guess when I made my comment about the generator reliability obligation, that's a focus on dispatchability rather than flexibility. So now on to storage. Now, I'm a big fan of thermal storage, and we'll come back to this a bit later. Um, but I'm only going to talk about electricity storage. That's electricity in, something happens, and then electricity comes out the other side. Um, but there are many other forms of electricity storage, but I'm going to focus on batteries. So what we have here is a battery, a 50 megawatt battery in what's described as an always on model. So it's providing dynamic frequency response, which is the blue line, which is going up and down. And underneath, you can see um, a red dotted line, which is the battery recharging. And then we get to the evening, and then it provides capacity. So it's providing energy to support demand. And that's when the battery is discharging. So a battery can operate somewhere in its range. As long as it's got enough room to go up and down, it can provide frequency response. However, no single battery can deliver, let's say, a really fast response plus capacity to meet peak. So no, there's no one solution that fits all. So we've, we've heard a little bit about fast frequency response, and batteries can do um, a sub-50 millisecond, so sub-cycle response, but they tend to be able to only do that for a short duration and that's a different battery technology to a battery that you might deploy if you wanted to um, support peak demand in the evening. The other issue is that storage likes volatile prices because that's where it makes its money. So if you try to protect customers or insulate them from this, these volatile price signals, then it's difficult for storage to be economic. Um, and I guess I said earlier, in all the, all the countries where batteries have deployed, it's because a service has been developed that acts as an income stream for that asset. So the investor will want to see that they're going to get payback. If you don't have that income stream, um, storage won't come, except if you're a network operator and you're trying to avoid reinforcement. So this is um, domestic demand profile in Victoria. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? We're trying to keep everybody's lights on. Um, and lots of people have solar PV, and they're thinking, how can I maximize that investment in my rooftop solar? Um, as you can see, 63% of energy use in a home is heat and cold. And indeed, it is the cooling that is going to cause us the problems we saw earlier in the opportunity statement, summer peak demand on a hot day. So this really is about thermal energy and not electricity. A domestic battery is never going to be able to deliver you overnight cooling with your air conditioning. It's just not designed to do that. It won't run your oven. So how do we meet these loads? And David challenger, challenged us at the beginning to come up with a problem for summer peak. And why is it that when we go home on a hot day, we walk in the front door, 
and we crank down the temperature in our house and we expect the poor air conditioning unit to go from you know, a home at maybe 25, mid-20s, down to something that we find acceptable. Maybe we even try and make it cool 10 degrees on a hot day. When, in fact, your building is a thermal store, and if we had good building design, you could be self-consuming your solar PV to run your air conditioning, to cool your house, and then you wouldn't go home and ping on the air conditioning at the same time as everybody else in Victoria and ramp up demand. So do domestic customers need battery? And I guess the reason I'm talking about this is we've heard a lot, some, some people today have talked about how domestic batteries are going to be aggregated together to deliver system support services. And the problem with aggregating batteries together, well, A, somebody's got to pay for those batteries, whether it's a utility or the customer. I'll come back to that in a bit, but here we go with the duck curve. So Rosemary correctly stated with her beautiful picture of the MCG that spectators are rushing onto the paddock and in the ENA CSIRO roadmap, they also said that care is needed. If you're going to use distributed energy resources, you need to manage them so that you do get the service that you actually want. Um, and so here is an example. So for example, in Germany, they incentivize behind the meter storage, but the requirement was that your battery um, reduced the export of your solar PV by 60% over the entire 20 year lifetime of your PV panels. There was no time signal. There was no requirement for you to minimize export at midday, which is when the system has its problem. So here we have, if you, so the duck curve shows the minimum demand and the steep ramping in the evening up to evening peak. And I'm looking here at the pale blue bottom line. If you put a battery in and you have no, no smart forecasting in there, as soon as the sun comes up, it's gonna start mopping up your PV generation. It may be fully charged by mid-morning, meaning that by midday, it's just not there anymore to mop up the midday peak, um, and so it's not going to help with that export problem that causes minimum demand and the technical difficulties with voltage issues and so on. So there are some domestic storage providers that will give you a weather forecasting application in there that will target the battery to midday if that's available to you. Um, However, if you have charged up your battery, it may not help with the minimum demand or the um, rogue hod, the ramping of de demand, but it will help you with some of the peak demand in the evening, but it probably won't help you with all of it. So here's a little thought experiment. Um, I guess I like utility scale batteries. Um, and then you can have domestic scale batteries. So there are a number of projects that show demand response is about 47%. So if you ask a domestic customer to respond, 24% will, the rest won't. So if you want a one megawatt response, you have to hold more than you actually need to guarantee that one megawatt service. That means you need a lot of batteries, that costs a lot of money, it tends to be a slow response because you have to allow the domestic consumer the opportunity to opt out. And if you want a sub cycle response, that's not something you're ever going to achieve from domestic batteries unless you have priority over that asset, like the fridges. If you have priority over an asset, you can deliver that. Then you have who is going to look after these batteries to ensure that they're going to be there and respond in the way that you want. And I've got thermal um, down there, thermal energy storage. There are a lot of programs around the world using hot water tanks as a demand turn up service, which work extremely well and are much, much cheaper than batteries. Even though I love electricity storage, it's not very cheap. Or you could deploy a utility scale battery. Um, 
Utilities like batteries because it allows them to avoid reinforcement. There's a project in Queensland, well, it's not a project, it's a business as usual now, where the batteries have been used on single wire earth return circuits to provide additional support without needing to reinforce the lines. Um, but there is an issue with utilities owning generation because that's what batteries are classed as in Australia. They're classed as generation and it's difficult for regulated entities to own and operate other regulated assets. So I guess, and I guess we do have batteries coming onto the system in Australia. So we've got the 100 megawatt battery in South Australia. We've got 40 megawatts about to be announced for Victoria. Very excited to know who's won that. And Queensland have uh, got a 100 megawatt tender out now, and they require, as was mentioned earlier, 20% um, capacity as batteries for solar projects. But most of these large-scale batteries are for political reasons rather than for technical system need. And we're still waiting to see the economic stack up for technical system need in Australia. Thank you. Okay, Vicky Bill, could I ask our speakers to come up, please? Uh, and we've got a uh, question and answer session. We'll cut it a little bit short. We actually started 10 minutes late, and we're actually pretty much on, on time for, from when we started, um, but we'll keep the questions to 10 or 15 minutes at the most. So, have we got any questions, please? Yes. Uh, this is Johnny. Oh, yes, sorry. You, yes. Um, you <laughs> I can, like I said, I can usually fill a room unaided. Uh, uh, John, you, you, you trailed this tempting question at the end, which I couldn't think of an answer to, so I want to hear yours, <laughs> which is, you know, if you've got all this grid already installed in, in uh, the La Trobe Valley, trundling into Melbourne, and it's not much use for doing what it was built for, what can we do with it instead? I'd love to know your answer to that. I'm not going to venture the answer to it. I, I'm throwing that open to everybody to have a think about it, because uh, I really think that's, that's something also for the, uh, for the state government to think about as well. OK, another question? I have a question for um, Ivan. Um, and I'm a little out of my, in fact, I'm grossly out of my depth here, but um, is it sensible to talk about the amount of spinning <coughs> turbines we will have, spinning reserve we'll have in 2050 under the Finkel modelling, whereby uh, by 2050 we'll still have, I think it was 25, no, 35 to, well, if we're in business as usual, 55%. Um, uh, dispatchable generation, largely uh, coal and gas, uh, and some hydro, of course. Is it, is it sensible to talk about that as providing all the inertia that we will need in a grid? And if so, what's, let's say uh, we've got a grid of, in the Victorian case, let's look at it as isolated, it's about eight gigawatts. So how much inertia do we need? What supply of inertia by spinning reserve do we need? That's a very tough question. We have made certain assumptions when we wrote that report down and um, some of those assumptions should be tested on the grid uh, that we have, which is a very long stretch grid, not very highly interconnected, so it has certain weaknesses that we have not completely digested. But in principle, yes, the report said that the Finkel uh, scenarios that were presented to us from Jacob could actually be managed, uh, provided we had a slight adaptation, not under the present rules, but there were rules that we could envisage that could make it work. Uh, and, and that was basically suggested. With a little bit of optimization, uh, you will need to have probably a little bit more spinning reserve running than uh, you expect when you have a very high penetration of renewables, but that's basically something that you can cost, that you can put on the name, and like you heard, you could either do by regulation or you can do it by uh, a constraint, a financial constraint, so that you pay for that extra service in realizing it. So that's feasible. Um, I think the review did not ask us to go to 100% renewables with battery storage and other storage facilities. That is a bigger challenge uh, because the notion of frequency actually, despite I've heard people say 
Power electronics does not define frequency. Uh, frequency in power electronics comes from clocks, and I would challenge anybody here to try two inverters and put them on a grid and see how long they run. And in 15 minutes, it will be unstable. And that's simply because of the clock frequency that is running at high. Uh, you have to declare the boss, and you have to declare the communication infrastructure in order to make this work. And that's something that we don't have for the moment. Well, are there technologies that could come into play if we had 100% renewables? Which yes. Are largely yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Look, look the, um, uh, the communication infrastructure comes with the new generators. Um, they have to be communicating with our EMO all their information. You have optical fibre connection usually, if it's anything substantial. Um, and uh, but you do need to have fast communications and if you want to get uh, deal with system disturbances and those fast communications sometimes need a little bit of, uh, of speeding up of systems for example if you're monitoring everything um, with a sort of SCADA type system it's not looking at every parameter all at once um, and so there is some refinement of that needed but it's, there's no, it's, it's not in, inherently, it's, it's, it's all, all doable. Yes, I agree. <laughs> not buying it off the shelf right now. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess I was just going to say that the AGC, which is the current thing that we use to provide signal, is not designed to be a frequency yeah. signaler. Yeah. And so that's why some, we're having problems with uh, frequency yeah. control in Australia at the moment. Oh, yes. But you're having problems also because your frequency control rules are yes. designed at the lowest common denominator yes. instead of the best achievable yep. or even good practice from yep. an engineering point of view. Yep. Don't tell me there are other rule problems. Snow. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be having a good time there. I was about to ask you whether the NBN would do it. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I, the real question was, Will pumped hydro do it? You know, how big a you know, can you get big enough spinning wheels out of um, sufficiently sized pump hydro? Um, look, the, the pumped hydro is, is is something that needs to be balanced with interconnections to deal with the, the large amounts of storage that are needed um, to deal with uh, climate variability. Um, in terms of uh, pumps uh, of hydro plant res responding to system disturbances, it's not that good. Um, it's, yeah, so I guess... It, not, it can be done, though. It's not, it's, it, we don't do it very well in Australia, but it can be used. But it is possible. But there are big inertia machines as well, but you have to have them running, of yeah. course. Yeah. And that's what we normally don't do. And, and you've mentioned fast frequency response. The wind generators, frequency they response. themselves have big rotating machines. But unlike synchronous machines, they're not inherently tied to the frequency. But the, the converters they with can be. relatively yeah. fast uh, response um, can suck additional energy out of those rotating machines as required if merely they are asked to do so or paid to do so. <coughs> And I guess I was going to say, in the UK, the pumped hydro does provide frequency response, but it has a response time of six seconds. And yes. that, that was U the UK's fastest responding asset. Um, and they have brought in what's called an enhanced frequency response, which is analogous to our fast frequency response. None of those assets are online yet. They should be by the end of the year, but that was 200 megawatts of battery enhanced frequency response. So that's sub one second response. So the UK used to have 12 seconds to manage a system disturbance. They're now down to sort of seven seconds, which is getting marginal for pumped hydro. And so this is why they've developed the equivalent of a fast frequency response service. Now, while we got under pumped hydro very briefly, I'll do a plug for, I think it's the Melbourne Energy Institute and Grattan Institute having a, a seminar here tomorrow night. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, free plug. Thank you, David. That's very kind of you. Uh, yeah, tomorrow night uh, here, uh, Kath Tanner, um, Yvor Frischnet, the CEO of 
Arena. So Kath Tanner is the MD of Energy Australia, Evo Frischnet, and uh, some engineers from Arab uh, Energy Australia and MEI are launching a report which is funded by Arena on a particular site and the feasibility of pumped hydro there. So I encourage you to come along to that. I will be on the beach at Byron Bay strolling along the beach with my, with my wife at the time <laughs> on annual leave, but I encourage you to come. <laughs> it's not actually here, it's in um, the community <laughs> field or something. <laughs> Nearby, <laughs> at Melbourne University. Uh, uh, Sydney Meyer, Sydney Meyer. Sydney Meyer. Don't throw it. Don't okay, throw it. more questions? <laughs> Tony. I guess I was um, picking up on this issue of transmission because historically in the way our market has been developed, the decisions to invest in generation, A, have been largely based upon the regional supply and demand and B, uh, have been left to the private sector. I mean, or, or, to, or to independent generators in a sense, not the regulator. So in some cases you had government-owned generators but they were making the decisions on the in-region opportunity to make money, basically. Transmission, on the other hand, was largely, the, the need for transmission and who paid for it was largely a regulatory decision. So people brought the other case, they had this writ T test to determine whether it was economic. I mean, you could argue whether those, that's no longer applicable, but it was a regulatory decision. So basically the regulator decided, and once they said yes, the consumer paid for it regardless of whether it was ever used, right? That was the net. It seems to me the model has fundamentally been changing in the sense that, well, they actually compete with each other, and particularly all the stuff that we've been talking about this afternoon. I'm interested, do you have any thoughts about, well, does that mean we'll screw the market, we'll go back to a centrally planned system? And I don't, you know, Alan, made, Alan Finkel made the point very clearly that a bit of planning would seem like a good idea. <laughs> um, but how far do we move back, do you think, in terms of this issue of, well, do these things now have to be part of a centrally planned regulated system, which largely is what the UK's got? Or do we find ways, we talked earlier today about, well, you can regulate or you can have markets for some of these services. Do we still try and integrate much more complex markets in a sense that we still depend upon private sector investment and competition to get better outcomes? Yeah. Well, cer certainly the, um, the grid operators and number of private investors in grids and the like um, are responding to the recommendation about uh, developing renewable energy zones in which the grid is enhanced specifically to make available points of connection for new generation. And uh, I think this, is, this is, has got a very good prospect. Um, I, the thing that, that interests me most for Victoria is what's going to happen in response to this, uh, this uh, current consultation and RITT on Northwest Victoria. Um, because the AEMO sought to rely primarily on the, on the Victorian renewable energy target to justify it ahead of commitments of generators. And what, now what's happening is more generators are already committing um, beyond what the grid can carry and clever grid controls are being designed so that if they lose a line and everything is going to overload, they trip off those generators. Well, you can do that just so far, because at the moment the grid will only survive tripping off 600 megawatts, and uh, you know if you're if you're looking at tripping off 1500, you won't. You'll have a you'll have a national blackout, <laughs> or at least a statewide one, probably national. National problem. <laughs> yeah. Depending where it happens, national. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.